you're now watching. Around the Horn. The weekly internationalist news update with author and historian Gerald Horn. Okay, today is March 27, 2024, and we have a uh, welcome everyone to the weekly series entitled Around the Horn, which is an internationalist news update with Gerald Horn. Gerald Horn currently holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Gerald Horn is an activist, scholar, researcher, archivist, author, historian, attorney, and much, much more. Dr. Horn has written at least 47 books. His most recent book, which is which was edited by Tian Aliyah Paris, is I Dare Say, a Gerald Horn reader, which is sort of a greatest hits of Dr. Horn's writings. Dr. Horn is also a permanent guest on the radio show The Horn Report, which airs on Black Power 96 radio on Sundays at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. And Dr. Horn also hosts a radio show entitled Freedom Now, which airs on KPFK 90.7 FM on Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific. And replays of both shows can be found on the Activist News Network if you're not able to watch them live. Dr. Horn, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome back to Around the Horn. Thank you for inviting me. Well, as we go around the horn, one of the first things I wanted to ask you about is the increasing talk from experts and analysts about World War III. Previously, experts and analysts frequently used the terms New Cold War, Cold War II. We were clearly in a rapidly changing global correlation of forces. What is your assessment of how we reached this point and how do we reach the point where discussions of World War III are increasingly more and more common? Well, first of all, I think it's important to provide some background, uh, particularly with regard to European histories, because if that fatal, fateful day of World War III ever approaches or arrives, which would fundamentally mean the extinction of humanity, uh, the ignition point would probably be in the North Atlantic countries and probably in North America and Europe, which brings me to the fundamental contradiction of European history, which is that Russia is the giant of the continent in terms of population, 150 million strong versus number two, Federal Republic of Germany, 82 million. It is the part of Europe that is endowed with more resources, including gold, diamonds, oil, natural gas, Yet, with the looting of the Americas and Africa by the Western European nations, particularly Britain and France, uh, they have wielded outsized influence and power on global affairs for centuries. And so that set up conflicts between Russia and the Western European nations embodied 200 years ago with Napoleon, who sought to invade Russia and had his hat handed to him, that is to say, he was defeated. And then a few decades later, in the 1850s, you had the so-called Crimea War, where Britain, France, and Turkey uh, ganged up on Russia, not without consequence, to Russia, that is. And then, once again, in 1904, you saw British capitalists fund a rising Japan and an attack on Russia. All that served to do was create the backdrop for the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which we'll return to shortly. And then, of course, there's the Hitler invasion of 1941, and of course, the Cold War, uh, spearheaded by the United States of America post the end of World War II. But even before the uh, Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which helped to ignite the Hitler invasion of 1941 and the US Cold War, uh, even before that, you saw the contradiction between Russia and the European nations because when the Ethiopians defeated the Italian invaders in 1890s, one of the major reasons is that they were armed to the teeth by Russia because Russia had an interest in making sure that its Western European neighbors did not grab more plunder and loot from Africa than they already had. And that of course serves for to provide a predicate and explanation for the Soviet Union support for African liberation movements, which attracted uh, intellectuals and activists from the Pan-African world, Paul Robeson, the great art artist, activist, and intellectual in the first instance. But obviously the legacy and life of Robeson illustrates how seriously this Moscow initiative was taken because of course, with the launching of the Cold War post 1945, uh, he was persecuted 
pillory from pillar to post. However, it's interesting to note, and it's rarely discussed, that in the latter stages of the 20th century, uh, many of our friends in the Black Liberation Movement and the U.S. left, left writ large were quite uh, critical of the Soviet Union, but particularly after the eruption of the split between China and the Soviet Union, uh, which takes flight post-1956. Recall that in 1956, the Soviet leader following Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, basically unloaded on the Stalin years from the 1920s to 1950s, and China did not take kindly to that, although that was their official explanation for the launching of the split, which then takes on a deeper meaning about 50 years ago when U.S. President Richard M. Nixon uh, travels to China to break bed, break bread with Mao Zedong. Uh, this is a turning point in world history leading to the encirclement of the Soviet Union. And that in con combination with the United States backing of religious zealots in Afghanistan after the Soviets had intervened December 1979 to help to rescue a left-leaning regime uh, that weakened the Soviet Union tremendously. Now, I have to say that I have a particular stake in these issues. In 1975, I wrote the first one of the first uh, pieces critical uh, in the Black Liberation Movement of Chinese policy in Africa. Uh, you can probably find it online. Certainly, you can find it at the Schomburg uh, Center in your neighborhood. Uh, that is to say, uh, China as a Trojan horse of U.S. imperialism in Africa. It had to do with the Angola crisis, Angola surging to independence during that time, rescued by the dispatching of Cuban troops, but then facing an invasion from apartheid South Africa, assisted by the U.S. CIA, uh, some of our black power friends, uh, because they were pro-China, uh, found themselves on the same side as apartheid South Africa, which of course was a fatal blunder, a major blunder, which has hardly been explained or explored since then. Now, of course, the United States paid a heavy price for its alliance with China. It led to massive foreign direct investment uh, in the People's Republic of China, which has now created this juggernaut. And as of 2024, the United States is trying to take down China. And one of the differences, one of the differences between the two wings of the U.S. ruling class is that the Trump wing wants to cut a deal with Russia so as to better confront China, whereas the Biden wing feels that they can weaken Russia so as to better uh, confront the China, weakening Russia, of course, through the caper and misadventure in Ukraine. Now, uh, what the, I'm suggesting is that unlike the Soviet Union, which had a self-contained uh, party-controlled, government-controlled economy, uh, because of this entente with U.S. imperialism, China has a mixed economy. The commanding heights of the economy, uh, banking, uh, energy, uh, transport, et cetera, is controlled by the state. But obviously, with Huawei and ByteDance, which controls TikTok, uh, you have a major private sector uh, in China. And, and in fact, you have a major U.S. private sector in China, too, with Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, Starbucks, et cetera. Uh, obviously, this private sector uh, in China, when they venture out into Africa, it can create contradictions and problems. Um, in coming weeks, we'll be discussing how that manifests with regard to the Democratic Republic of the Congo in particular. But in any case, what is remarkable is just as many in our movement back China when it was allied with the United States, they are now opposing China when it's in the crosshairs of US imperialism. And I think that this leads to a negative global reputation of many of our friends on the US left, many of our friends in the Black Liberation Movement, because they're viewed globally as perpetually finding a way to align with US imperialism. Uh, that is to say, uh, this uh, anti People's Republic of China line is replicated in Africa itself. Uh, when you see uh, folks speaking of China as the new imperialist, the new colonialist in Africa, although they have little or nothing to say about the role of Turkey uh, in Africa, particularly Somalia, where they're the power behind the throne, particularly Libya, where they play a mu muscular role, little to say about the role of the United Arab Emirates. And in fact, I predict, and it doesn't take a soothsayer or oracle to predict this, 
that if somehow the United States is able to dislodge this Communist Party of China from power, just like the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was dislodged from power, it'll probably be, be because of the U.S. alliance with India, uh, which is unfolding as we speak. In fact, uh, Apple is amongst the U.S. corporations which are trying to move their operations from China into India. And I dare say that if that fatal day ever arrives, uh, you'll see many of the folks who are critical of China pivot uh, and then turn on India because, of course, if India replaces China, then U.S. imperialism will turn on uh, India. And let me also mention a few uh, test cases. For example, uh, Angola, I already mentioned uh, about the negative role that China played in the 1970s. But today, uh, Angola and China relations are very close, very tight. President Lorenzo just spent a few days in, in Beijing, came back with all manner of deals and contracts that are going to uh, propel the Angolan economy. And it seems that if the Angolans, who probably paid the heaviest price uh, in recent decades because of the often negative role of China, if they can reconcile uh, with China, well, I'm not sure why others cannot either. Likewise, another test case is Zimbabwe. After the ruling party uh, expropriated land from European invaders about two decades ago, the United States slapped sanctions on Zimbabwe, tried to drive Zimbabwe into the ditch, and that would have happened, but for the massive assistance from the People's Republic of China, which of course uh, is not necessarily a gift because uh, Zimbabwe uh, has chrome and has lithium necessary for the green economy. And uh, now uh, China can benefit from that and well, helps to explain why China is the leader now in green energy. South Africa is, is a mixed picture because during the period of uh, China's anti-Sovietism, uh, on the one hand, you had China training uh, African National Congress militants in guerrilla warfare uh, on the mainland of China. On the other hand, it was no secret that China was upset with the ANC because it had an interlocking directorate with the South African Communist Party, which was in turn close uh, to uh, Moscow. So uh, let me just conclude by saying that as we speak, uh, China is being encircled. It has 14 neighbors amongst its borders. And I have not seen any uh, press accounts about this. But I suspect that right now what's happening is that the United States is sponsoring and funding an insurgency in Myanmar, which is one of uh, China's neighbors on the southern border, uh, so as to create an anti-Beijing front along the southern border. We all know about the United States relationship in this regard with the Philippines, which has been jousting with Chinese vessels in the South China Sea in recent weeks. We know about uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, who actually will be in the White House uh, this week. It's probably arrived as of today. And that uh, anti-Beijing alliance is tightening. And of course, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, uh, the conservative wing of the ruling class of South Korea, which is now in power, seeks to heighten contradictions with North Korea, uh, more so than the liberal wing of the South Korean ruling class, uh, which is more anti-Tokyo than it is uh, anti-Chairman uh, Kim, for example. In any case, that's just some background uh, for understanding many of these issues that we're going to be discussing. And so let me ask you, I know I was speaking rapidly, uh, <laughs> trying to jam all this information in. Uh, are there any points that you see that demand clarification, elucidation, or should we just plunge into the issues of the week? Yeah, I, mean, I guess, um, you know, one of the things you pointed out uh, last year was was when Kamala Harris went to Africa, pretty much everywhere she landed, the airport was either constructed by China or in some sort of collaboration with China. Um, and we had a question in the, in the chat from, from, from Cherry um, or Sherry, mm -hmm. Uh, will Modi be reelected? Re My friends and family are from there, and he, is, he and his friends live there. He just returned. He, he just returned and says and says no. It, it, for me, it'd be hard to imagine that Modi doesn't win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess another point to mention that's come out, I guess, in the past week or so, is that um, 
uh, India has has been pressured by the U.S. not to accept Russian energy, um, and to a certain extent, they've complied with that demand. Um, do you have a response for for Sherry or any comment about the development in terms of India and and their their pressure by the U.S.? Well, I have to say I'm taken aback by this idea that the BJP of the ruling uh, Hindu chauvinist party of Prime Minister Modi will be defeated in these upcoming elections because all signs point in an opposing direction. In fact, he's cracked down on the opposition, including uh, the Congress party, which has been a dominant party in India since independence in August, 1947. Not to mention cracking down on regional parties uh, as well. Uh, and let me reiterate the, the wider point which is that there is this unfolding alliance between India and the United States of America based upon mutual hostility towards the People's Republic of China. But what the United States is not able to grapple with effectively is that probably India's closest ally historically since independence in 1947 has been Moscow. Uh, that was during the Soviet days. It's in the post-Soviet days. And that gives the Soviet Union quite a bit of leverage. It means that so the Soviet Union, excuse me, it means that Russia uh, sits athwart this contradiction between China and India and is close to both, obviously. And that's going to be a very difficult alliance for Washington to disrupt. And in any case, if by some stroke of fate, they are able to, speaking of US imperialism, once again, to dislodge the Chinese Communist Party, all it's going to mean <laughs> is that uh, India will be in the crosshairs and that will then lead to an ever closer relationship with Russia. <laughs> so the United States will be faced with just another dilemma. The dilemma they're faced today is difficulty in confronting Russia and China simultaneously. Uh, the dilemma of the latter part of the 21st century, perhaps, perhaps, is confronting Russia and India simultaneously. All of this does not bode well for U.S. imperialism. If it were a stock, that is to say, if U.S. imperialism was, were a stock, you would short it. You would bet that its value uh, would fall. And I think that that's a very safe prediction. Yeah, and I guess um, you talked about how the U.S. is encircling China. And I guess a follow-up question to that, of, of course, um, you know, U.S. is... is trying to use Taiwan as a sort of proxy, like they use Ukraine with Russia. There's the Philippines, there's South Korea, there's Japan. But in the chat, um, Mark also sort of asked about Indonesia um, and the recent election in Indonesia. And we've all, we've seen basically the the entire region is a, is a new front line for the Cold War. The Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, um, and, and um, but since Mark raised Indonesia, do you have any comments about the recent election in Indonesia or anything going on in Indonesia at this juncture? Well, it, it's, it's a very tricky question. In, Indonesia being the largest predominantly Islamic nation on planet Earth. Uh, Indonesia, by some measures, the fourth most populous nation on planet Earth. Uh, Indonesia, once again, being a storehouse of natural resources, including oil. Indonesia being the uh, largest archipelago in terms of nations on planet Earth. And Indonesia also, and, and here's the twist, uh, having one of the largest uh, populations of Chinese ancestry, which plays a leading role in the economy. And that, of course, is the case for in the entirety of Southeast Asia, of which Indonesia is a component part. Uh, 700 million plus people in Southeast Asia in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, and in virtually every nation you can think of, be it Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, the Chinese elite play an instrumental role in the economy. In fact, uh, I'm glad that's raised because in order to explain the rise of the Chinese economy, you not only have to look at the massive foreign direct investment from US corporations, you have to look at the investment from the Chinese diaspora, uh, particularly Indonesia, and that is something that has been manipulated by the right wing historically. There have been anti-Chinese pogroms in Indonesia. The fact that the Chinese elite plays such a major role in the economy uh, 
problematize the ability of even a patriotic Ind Indonesian regime, which admittedly we ne don't, do not necessarily have to date with the recent elections, it makes it problematic for any regime to get closer uh, to Beijing. And so obviously it makes it difficult for Vietnam to get closer to uh, China as well. Um, we know about the conflicts between Vietnam and China over the years, uh, which has led US presidents, including Mr. Biden, to try to get ever closer uh, to Vietnam. But having said all of that, uh, I'm relatively optimistic about the ability of Indonesia and China to build bridges towards one another. Uh, do you see that with regard to the Belt and Road Initiative, this multi-billion dollar initiative of China to build infrastructure uh, from uh, Asia through Africa, in fact. Indeed, with the attacks by the Yemenis on ships going through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, uh, that's put a premium on the Belt and Road Initiative of building a railway from Eastern China all the way to Portugal, for example, uh, traversing a good deal of Russian territory, benefiting Russia, in fact. And so China has poured a lot of capital into Indonesia as well in recent years. And hopefully that investment in Indonesia, particularly in its infrastructure in terms of high-speed trains, uh, will help to win uh, Indonesia away from any sort of uh, anti-Chinese alliance featuring Australia, the United States, Japan, the Philippines, North, excuse me, South Korea, et cetera. Thank you for that. One thing I, you know, I'm sort of a broken record when it comes to Papua New Guinea and, and West Papua. Uh, so, but one thing I, I wanted to point out was that, you know, the U.S. is playing sort of a heavy handed role in Papua New Guinea, in, in, in my view, in an effort to prevent it from getting closer to China, like the Solomon Islands. And not only has Papua New Guinea signed security agreements with Australia, um, but also with Indonesia, uh, which presents a major problem for the people of West Papua. Um, that's just something I wanted to point out. Um, but I, I think we should probably turn to some of the topics of the day. Um, Mark, um, let me put his question up. Is it, he had a similar question that AZ uh, had, um, AZ is a, is a fan of the show, a big fan of yours, Dr. Horn. And um, on the Gerald Horn Facebook page, he raised a similar question to Mark, um, asking about the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse um, and also the election in Senegal. I guess, can we start in the reverse order? Um, what was your reaction to the election in Senegal and, and how significant is that um, particularly since the, the new president or the president-elect um, has vowed to um, shake off the colonial grip of Senegal, similar to some of its neighbors? Well, on the surface, it's positive. Uh, we have a 44-year-old president-elect, the youngest head of state uh, on the African continent, one of the youngest in the world. Uh, Senegal, of course, is an island of stability. Uh, in that part of Africa, never endured a coup, unlike many of its neighbors, for example, uh, Ghana, for example. Uh, the president-elect also made a very stinging uh, condemnation of France's neocolonialism, uh, which is sort of a turnabout, because if you look at the history of Senegal, going back to founding father uh, Leopold Senghor some decades ago, they were notoriously uh, pro-French, uh, to the point where President Senghor uh, in, in some ways was more of an expert on the French language than many of the major French intellectuals. Of course, uh, President Senghor was followed uh, uh, by a, a string and a train of uh, pro-French leaders. And what was remarkable about this recent election is that the president-elect was in jail as recently as a few weeks ago. <laughs> and now he's the president-elect. And in that speech by Thabo Mbeki that I referenced last week, Thabo Mbeki being the second president after Mandela in South Africa, uh, Thabo took some credit, if you like. Uh, I'm not sure if it's accurate. Uh, I didn't double check it. But Thabo said that he was in touch with the current president, Macky Sall, who had jailed the two leaders of the opposition until recently and had encouraged and enticed him uh, 
uh, uh, Mackie Saul to to release them, and now Mackie Saul's uh, designated successor has been defeated. Uh, this anti-French neo-colonialist line will fit very well with events in Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Niger, exam for example. Niger, of course, being an example of a nation that's ousted the French altogether and in the process of ousting the uh, drone base of U.S. imperialism in, in their country. So on the surface, it's very good news, this election in Senegal. But let's wait and see, or better still, let's engage in solidarity uh, with the Senegalese progressive and radical movement. The Francis Scott Key Bridge, Francis Scott Key, of course, <laughs> being responsible for the lyrics to the U.S. national anthem, which in his third stanza, quite notoriously, <laughs> attacks black people. It's written during the British War of the United States, circa 1812 to 1814, when many blacks who are, of course are enslaved, uh, turn against their masters and help to burn down Washington, D.C., which infuriates Francis Scott Key, a major slave owner, and who of course uh, attacks the Negroes with venom and vigor uh, in that third notorious third stanza. But in any case, uh, you saw a ship headed to Sri Lanka hit the bridge and the bridge crumples leading to the death, interestingly enough, of a number of Latino workers uh, Guatemalan and Salvadorian and Mexican origin, interestingly enough, which says something about the nature of the U.S. working class in, in particular. Also, uh, given what we just said about the Suez Canal, given what we know about what's going on with the Panama Canal and problems there, particularly in getting ships through because of water issues, this combined with those two other issues, these two canal issues, uh, the question is, what impact will this have on the U.S. economy, since the U.S. economy is heavily dependent upon the Panama Canal in particular, and dependent to a certain extent on the Suez Canal uh, as well. So uh, once again, to look at this question globally, uh, perhaps it'll put more emphasis on China shipping goods, not across the Pacific, going through the Panama Canal and up through to the Atlantic Ocean, to Savannah, and Norfolk, and Baltimore, but instead using the, the train routes from across uh, Russia all the way to Western Europe and then transporting across the Atlantic. So this, this uh, destruction of this bridge is more than a notion. It's going to be out apparently for a while, although the White House uh, pledges that that will not be the case. Well, we have less than two minutes left and I, I know you have to log off right at uh at 8 30. um i don't know if, if if you want to talk about the the, the ceasefire at the u.n security council or the terrorist attack in moscow or if there's another topic you want to discuss in the remaining minute and a half well j just briefly and first of all let me apologize for my the harry nature of my discourse uh, no this need evening. to apologize no no <laughs> <laughs> because uh I'm in the midst of a number of different meetings right now. But in any case, uh, the, the attack in, the crocus attack in Russia is, is very ominous, very serious. Uh, I could s recite a whole litany about US imperialism collaborating with religious zealots. Recall I mentioned that with regard to the downfall of the Soviet Union uh, as a result of its intervention in Afghanistan. Uh, in Syria, the US has collaborated with religious zealots and took a rescue by Iran and Russia to preserve the uh, al-Assad regime. And uh, don't be surprised if the United States aligns with religious zealots in uh, Mali and Burkina Faso and Niger because of US hostility to those regimes. It's very curious that the alleged perpetrators were headed westward <laughs> to the Ukraine border for whatever reason, although they were from allegedly the South of uh, Moscow, uh, for example, Tajikistan, and some have been residing uh, most recently in Turkey, or Turkey, interestingly enough. So it, it's all a very curious episode, and perhaps it bespeaks the hysteria in the North Atlantic camp because of their impending defeat in Ukraine, uh, a defeat which would have 
monumental consequence for the global correlation of forces. And then finally, with regard to the U.S. Uh, abstention on the vote of the United Nations, on the um, <laughs> Israel genocide in Gaza, uh, the United States clearly is trying to get rid of the captain, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. That does not necessarily mean a change fundamentally in policy because his designated successor, Benny Gantz, in some ways is quite hawkish as well. And uh, although he will not have the same kind of ultra-rightist, I believe, uh, the genocidaires, uh, such as Ben Gavir, for example, and Smotrich, in his coalition that uh, Netanyahu has in, in, in his coalition. So uh, it bespeaks the fact that Elon Pape, the well-known uh, analyst of Israel, has suggested that we're at the beginning of the end of the entire Zionist project. This clash between the United States and Israel perhaps is evidentiary of that. The United States increasingly does not see uh, Israel as a, an ally, given the fact that Israel is not uh, being helpful with regard to the Ukraine caper. Uh, before October 7th, uh, Mr. Netanyahu was a frequent visitor to Moscow. Israel has been accused of leaking sophisticated U.S. military technology to China. And therefore, uh, the Biden wing of the ruling class is beginning to see Mr. Netanyahu as fundamentally a crony and a comrade of the Trump wing of the ruling class. And they're wondering why should they uplift him? Why should they uphold him? And certainly they feel that they can get or they can help to assuage the reputational damage that they're now receiving from shipping weapons to Israel. And by the way, there has been little or no talk in Washington about seizing the flow of weapons uh, to Israel, irrespective of this talk about getting rid of Netanyahu. Thank you, Dr. Horn. And uh, now, now it's my turn to apologize that we're over. So I'm, I'm sorry we put so much on, on the table for you to address. Um, thank you. It's been an honor having you on the show, and we look forward to having you back um, next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren. And thank you. And once again, I apologize for my being so harried and harried this evening. No apologies. It's, it's of course, an honor um, to have you on the show. All right. Good luck. Bye-bye.